This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to start out because last time I gave a talk recently, I forgot to do this. We're, we're uh, promoting our new Center for Parasitic and Carnivorous Plants. Somehow we uh, have amassed a pretty uh, large number of people working on this, on these sort of extreme, uh, strange lifestyle plants. And so we're trying to um, get some momentum and, and do some integrative work in these sort of odd systems. And I'll, I'll touch on some the parasitic plant that we're working on in the middle of the talk. So it, anyways, it's nice to be here. Um, we're working a lot on local adaptation, and that's a theme that runs throughout what I'm going to present today, the research I'm going to present. There are other topics involved, but local adaptation is kind of a, a central theme, and I'm going to try to rely on that to, to give a sort of broad intro here. And I've, I've started uh, developing a new introduction to my talk in the last few days because there's uh, a new sort of way, and it's not new really, but I've just <clears throat> wanted to present uh, uh, a certain side to the local adaptation uh, problem that we're thinking about. And so I want to start by um, talking about trade-offs and the idea that there is no such thing as a free lunch or that the trade-offs are ubiquitous. Now, I, I really like this. This is sort of an aphorism that's used a lot in economics, uh, but it really sticks in the back of my mind. And, and I, I consider myself at heart an evolutionary ecologist, although we do genetics and physiology as well. But um, I really sort of often am inspired by the really close connections between ecology and economics. And of course, that goes back a long time to the to the roots of those words. But I also, the, the no free lunch thing really um, sticks in my mind a lot. And the origin of this phrase, I think is kind of neat. So from the 19th century, bars and saloons had this practice of advertising a free lunch to get people to come in and drink in the middle of the day. Um, but, you know, so this guy goes in and does that, of course, but there's obviously embedded in that clearly potential downside to that, uh, you know, getting drunk in the middle of the day. And so I think that that, that sort of is a nice, um, way to sort of set the, the framework for thinking about changes or, or things that might benefit plants or organisms in certain ways, but may limit them in others. So I want to move a little bit more in this, on this theme of, of, of trade-offs and talk briefly about this sort of idea that there, there may be constraints to our ability to improve our performance when we think about multiple, multiple dimensions of performance. So the idea of a Pareto front is, is one that's often used and when talking about this kind of work. And this, the idea is that a Pareto front is sort of the maximum possible performance you can have in multiple dimensions. So that if you move to a, a better state in one dimension, you're necessarily reducing your performance in another dimension. Now, you may think for where you're sitting in your given system and the given axes of performance or the given dimensions that you're thinking about, you may think that you're perhaps sitting pretty far from that front and you can perhaps improve in multiple dimensions that you care about at the same time. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that there are many dimensions to performance, many environmental contexts that lead to trade-offs, and that's one of the reasons why we see such biodiversity that we do. And I'll put this now in the context of local adaptation, and the idea with local adaptation is that there is a trade-off in fitness across environmental gradients, such that different genotypes have highest relative fitness depending on where you are along an environmental gradient. Just as an example, if we have some uh, continuous environmental gradient and you do two different common gardens in a reciprocal transplant experiment, let's say with these trees, this red genotype that's from the red environment has higher fitness in that environment, and that switches when you get to the other end of the environmental gradient. So this is a fitness trade-off, which defines local adaptation. And if you sort of want to plot that out in, on this, in this concept of the, the Pareto front, if you think that this genotype has some optimized performance for this environment A, where it's found and been presumably evolving for some period of time, if you move it to the environment that B is from, its performance necessarily is reduced and vice versa. So this is just sort of a general conceptual framework for local adaptation. And we're now going to sort of, I'm going to visit, start thinking about some specific questions that we have about local adaptation. Big picture questions that motivate us that we want to know about are the following. One is, how important is local adaptation? It's fairly straightforward to characterize genetic diversity among populations, either by sequencing things or by measuring things in controlled environment or common environments. Uh, but, but how much of that diversity that we see is because of local adaptation versus limited gene flow and genetic drift, which can also explain differences among populations. And why does this differ from system to system or through time, perhaps? Second major area of inquiry is what are underlying types of genetic mechanisms or physiological mechanisms involved in local adaptation? And then thirdly, are there potential applications of learning about local adaptation and how it happens? Is, are there perhaps applied biology benefits to this? So these 
major topics sort of frame the three sections of the talk. And for each of these sections, I sort of have a vignette in a different system, three different systems uh, that I'll go through today. So the first one in rice, Asian rice, I'm gonna be asking what's behind the genetic differences we see among populations, and specifically land races. So these are sort of traditionally adapted varieties of these crops. I'll come back to that concept in a moment. Secondly, in sorghum, you're gonna think about finding the genetic basis of local adaptation and seeing if that can tell us something about how local adaptation happens in, in sorghum land races. And then thirdly, in the model system of Arabidopsis, I'm going to think about how we may be able to apply some of our knowledge about the genetic basis of local adaptation. Okay, so first starting out on this question of how important is local adaptation or versus other factors that might explain some of the differences we see among populations. I wanna start out by making the case that land races of major crops are really nice systems for evolutionary genetics and evolutionary ecology. And, and that's because we have huge collections of diversity already existing in germplasm banks. And they're from really broadly distributed environments. So these are just the 2000 sorghum land races that we've done genotyping by sequencing on, uh, not in my lab, but with collaborators. And you can see they really span a range of precipitation environments. This, these colors are showing you growing season length. You can see something similar with the 1400 rice land races that we're working with here. They're from a pretty broad range of environments. So the idea with a land race is that it's a traditional variety rooted in a location. And so we think these things are locally adapted to a certain degree, which means that in these immense collections of land races, we have alleles and traits that are adapted to specific environments. And so that's perhaps a really useful resource for applied reasons as well. Uh, but also from the perspective of just learning about how selection and other evolutionary forces generate diversity or influence diversity, I think these are really nice systems. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to rice, which is the main system that I'm gonna talk about in the first part of this talk. Um, I wanna think about four sort of categories of covariate or explanatory factor that might um, be responsible for some of the genetic differences we see among land races. Now each one of these could correspond to, um, at, at heart, a process that is, uh, that is limited gene flow or that is local adaptation and differential selection. So first, ge geographic isolation. Now I think this is probably mostly gonna correspond to uh, patterns of gene flow, but land races that are found in different places will diverge simply because of genetic drift and limited gene flow. And we may be able to model that based on geographic distance or perhaps something a little bit more sophisticated, uh, which is an estimate of travel time. At the same time though, because environments are spatially autocorrelated, meaning that environments are similar nearby in space and as you move farther, you're more likely to move to a new environment. This could also correspond to changes in selection. Um, and then abiotic conditions we're going to consider. So we know that there is some role in abiotic gradients in selecting for different genotypes in space. Um, in, in rice land races and other major broadly distributed plants. And we're going to uh, include a number of abiotic conditions in this analysis as well. And now um, at the same time, also we know this broad region of traditional rice cultivation also has an immense human cultural diversity. And so it could be that, for example, groups that speak similar languages are more likely to share seed with each other. And so the gene flow may be greater with, uh, within language groups than among, or alternatively, there may be different cultural preferences that select for different types of gene, that select for different genotypes um, in between these different groups. So we're gonna consider these as well. And then um, a single locus mutation that we're gonna consider is the, the, the waxy locus. So this is the mutation that is responsible for creating gelatinous rice, or sticky rice. And there's reasons to think that there's limited gene flow between sticky and non-sticky varieties and also perhaps selection for additional traits that might interact with the sticky non-sticky phenotype. So each of these could correspond to something that predicts patterns of gene flow or selection. Mostly I'm gonna uh, spend some time talking, dissecting these a little bit more. So I'll give you some background and a sort of set up hypothesis for the diversity of rice. Within traditional varieties of rice that we have in our collections at least and that have sequenced, there are two main varieties, Japonica and Indica. And Japonica was the one that was domesticated earlier in the Yangtze Valley. And 
was had sp already started to spread by 3000 BC into Southeast Asia, 2000 BC into Northeast Asia. Um, compare that with in, so there's a lot going on here. I'm just going to try to focus on the important parts. Um, about 2500 BC, what's, what, what's referred to here as Proto-Indica, or one of the main ancestors of Indica, was still being just domestic, being grown just in, in northern Indian subcontinent. So the, the backdrop here is that Japonica domesticated here spread first, and then much later, Indica spread. And now they're sort of both broadly cultivated across this region. So perhaps given that, oops, perhaps given that Japonica spread earlier, there's been a greater time to accumulate genetic divergence between populations, either due to um, a longer period of genetic drift and isolation or a longer period of adaptation to local conditions. Now, thinking about limited gene flow, we want to try to be a little bit more sophisticated than just estimating patterns of gene flow based on geographic distance between locations. So one way we might do that is try to approximate the ways in which the seed moved about the landscape, which would be sort of low technology mechanisms of human movement. And so we've done this in collaboration with uh, Emma Slayton, who's a computational archeologist, and we're using what's sort of a simple standard function for estimating how fast people hike across the landscape, depending on the slope. And then also um, a, a fairly low speed of, of moving over the ocean, which is meant to sort of approximate historical traditional sailboats. And then we can take our full landscape of the entire East Asia and estimate how much it costs or how easy it is to move from place to place. And then for any given two points of interest, we can calculate a least cost path. So in this case, these green cells, these are higher cost. The least cost path from A to B skirts those green cells. Here's an example of a least cost path separating two of our land races. Rather than the <coughs> real geographic distance representing likely gene flow between these two, people would probably have skirted the Himalayas because both of these are low elevation sites. So the real least cost path and the likely distance may be better estimated by such something like this. So we're gonna apply these, this, this method to the broad diversity of land races that we have here. I'll give you some background on the data um, and, and the, the setup of this project. So this is a close collaboration with the Perugenin Lab at NYU. And the data we're working with are largely from the Rice 3000 Genomes Project. So about 1,200 of the land races that we use are from that. And then Perugenin Lab sequenced uh, almost 200 more rice uh, land races. So this is the broad distribution. This is the distribution of the 1,400 land races. And then if you look at an ordination of the uh, about 10 million SNPs that we have from those, you can see that the, the two main varieties, Indica and Japonica, are clearly distinguished on this first axis. And this is a pretty deep split. This explains about a third of that total SNP variation. So we're just gonna analyze these two separately, the Indica and Japonica. So let's look at how geographic distance or travel time explain genetic isolation. So for Japonica first, uh, we found that least cost travel time is favored. Now when I do this in these two plots here, I'm showing you what I'm calling island Japonica and then continental Japonica. And I'm separating these out because we think the mechanisms of movement might have been different between them. Our error and our bias in this predictive model may have been different between these two broadly different regions. So that's why I've split the two up. Uh, you can see with continental, continental Japonica, a, a fairly clean, um, at least lower bound on genetic divergence that's increasing with our estimated travel time. And in both cases, the, the, this travel time is fitting the model better than geographic distance. This is the island Japonica, it doesn't fit as well. Um, and I've also sort of separated out here comparisons between land races that are either in the same genetic cluster or in different ones, because there's two sort of main Japonica clusters, genetic clusters on the islands. So in this case, here's an example of a land race where, or a pair of land races, where travel time was a better predictor of isolation than geographic distance. And you can see this geographic distance was maybe a little ambitious going over these two mountain ranges, whereas it was sort of easier to sort of stick to the coast estimated from our predictive model. This is, this is for Japonica. Japonica is, the, is indeed the more genetically structured of the two. Uh, the average FST among nine clusters is about 0.46, whereas for Indica, it's only 0.24. And we can see with Indica, actually for Indica, the model selection favors geographic distance as a measure of isolation. And so this is again, uh, a measure of distance. Instead of travel time, it's actual kilometers. 
And then on the y-axis, again, is genetic divergence between pairs of land races. So overall, you can see the genetic divergence doesn't get as high for indica. And these relationships are also a bit weaker. They are positive, though. So there is still evidence that there's limited gene flow across space, but it's weaker for indica. So perhaps one way to interpret this is that hypothesis that I sort of set up before, which is that if Japonica spread earlier and perhaps was evolving and genetic drift was, or local adaptation was occurring in all these different places, especially when perhaps even technology of movement was lower, then there may have been longer period of time for the accumulation of these divergences, this divergence between land races of Japonica than Indica, which spread more recently. So perhaps that's why we're better able to predict genetic divergence with this, this movement model. It could be that human movement uh, technology changed a bit since the spread of Japonica such that we weren't modeling it as well for Indica. Okay, so I want to think again about these other factors now. So we looked at this issue of whether we might be able to predict variation based on travel time or geographic distance. And let's think about abiotic conditions, the waxy gene, and these language families. What we can do when we have all these different predictors that we're interested in and all these different SNPs, these different responses, um, one approach that we can use statistically is an ordination approach called redundancy analysis. This is an approach where you have multivariate predictors, which could be these different environmental variables or language groups, let's say, and then this multivariate response. And then in this toy example, this toy ordination of the data, you can see that we have, with these three SNPs, two that are co-varying across genotypes, across land races, let's say. So these are, these are allele counts, and so they're co-varying positively, but not this third SNP. And then if we look at these environmental gradients, we see that this temperature gradient is also co-varying with that changes in allele frequency, as is this precipitation gradient, but not this seasonality gradient. So when we do our ordination, our redundancy analysis, the first axis, which explains most of the genetic variation, separates the C and D genotype that are identical at those two SNPs from the A genotype and with the B sort of more intermediate. And these environmental gradients here show you the loadings or how much of this genetic divergence is explained by these two different climate variables. Seasonality is weakly related to that first axis. So that's how this ordination works, and we can apply this to these land race data with all these different explanatory factors. We can also ask how much of the variation in this multivariate response is explained by these different categories. So here's what I'm doing. You sh I'm, what I'm showing you here from the redundancy analysis is how much variation in the SNPs is explained by these different categories. So these are Euler plots, so that this whole box represents all the SNP variation in Japonica land races that we, that we analyzed. And then each of the ellipses represents the R squared for, or how much variation is explained by these different categories, travel time or the waxy mutation, language group, abiotic conditions. And the overlap between these indicates that there's a lot of collinearity. There's a lot of correlations between these explanatory factors that we can't separate in its contribution to explaining the SNP variation. So lots of the SNPs, so the biggest factor in both cases is this geographic isolation or travel time isolation that explains the biggest portion of SNP variation. Abiotic conditions explain a pretty large proportion of the variation in Japonica as well, but it's strongly overlapped with travel time, meaning that two things that are different in the abiotic environment are also farther away in space, and we can't really figure out, can't separate out well how much of the variation is due to that. The waxy mutation also has a substantial contribution in Japonica. But as before, I'll, I'll point out that not only with the geographic measures of isolation, which are the gray ellipses, but these other factors that we think may be important, those also have a lower explanatory power for SNP variation in indica than in Japonica. So again, indica is lower, has less structure along these other gradients besides this geographic gradient, also along abiotic gradients or language groups, for example. Now I want to focus a little bit more on what factors might be important amongst the abiotic variables. So this is for Japonica. This is showing you the Japonica land races that we analyzed, and they're colored according to nine different genetic clusters. So if we do this redundancy analysis on those, this first axis, which explains most of the SNP variation in Japonica, about 12% of the total SNP variation, this separates out largely more temperate Japonica from more tropical Japonica. So these are Northeast Asian and Southeast Asian. And then these vectors here show you the environmental, the climate variables. Well, there are abiotic, there are soil variables in there as well, but these climate variables come out as strongest. These are the showing you those that are most strongly associated with this axis of genetic divergence. And those are 
things largely associated with growing season temperatures, either growing season warmth or variability or a, or a lack of predictability in growing season length. So what this is saying is that if we take all the SNP variation in Japonica, the axis that explains the most of it is a gradient in temperature between tropical and temperate Japonica. So perhaps adaptation on temperature gradients explains some of what we see for divergence within Japonica land races. Now we also looked a little bit further here, trying to look back into history to try to understand the history of this divergence. So this is population genetic uh, demographic inference by Rafal Gutiker, the postdoc at NYU. So he first did cross coalescence to estimate the split time between tropical and temperate Japonica. And so he dates it at about 3,300 years ago with some error around that going from about 4,000 to 2,500 years ago. And what's interesting about this time frame is that it corresponds to a major cooling period known as the end of the mid Holocene optimum. So this is a period when in a lot of uh, the temperate Asia conditions cooled. So working with, uh, working with these um, archeologists, they did a uh, climate reconstruction of the suitability for tropical Japonica across the cultivated, traditional cultivated area of rice. So we think that in the original center of domestication, the rice that was originally domesticated was tropical Japonica-like, so adapted to tropical conditions. And if we look back, this is the start of the time series about 5,500 years ago, this yellow indicates a high suitability for tropical Japonica, meaning that temperatures were warm enough to support a, 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 Japonica, a tropical Japonica growing season in the Yangtze Valley. If we look back in that time period as well, this is mainly the region where rice was found. So rice really hadn't spread out of that region yet. Now, if we look forward in time, the animation that, that Kyle and Jade did is going to show you as temperatures declined starting about 4,500 years ago, East Asia, East, um, this, this region of East Asia, the Yangtze Valley, cools down substantially and becomes unsuitable for tropical Japonic. So the growing season length becomes much shorter and such that it's not really good for tropical Japonica. And this corresponds to the time at which tropical Japonica and temperate Japonica split um, around 3,000 or so years ago right here. And then what's interesting with this period as well is that it corresponds also to the period in which rice moved into Northeast Asia. So that we're taking as evidence that perhaps associated with this cooling event was adaptation of Japonica, tr historically tropical land races through temperate conditions, which permitted spread into Northeast Asia. So that's sort of our story that we draw from this evidence that I'm showing you here. Okay, so to conclude that section, we found that this movement modeling of, of human movement might be a way to try to get some better understanding of gene flow patterns across complex landscapes. And then also another major takeaway I'll give you is that Japonica seems to be much more strongly structured and particularly associated with growing season length and growing season temperatures across latitudes. Okay, so I wanna shift from that sort of broad genome wide view of variation among land races and to thinking a little bit more about specific genes or specific loci involved in adaptation to different environments. And I'm gonna start this section by making an observation, which I don't think I have to work too hard to convince you of, which is that doing common gardens and phenotyping in the field are, are very expensive and hard. And so this is sort of a traditional way that we can learn about local adaptation to different environments, but it's not easy. So let's think about some other ways we might be able to learn about genetic variation that is locally adapted. And one of these approaches is to do what we call gene and environment associations, which are similar in spirit to genotype phenotype associations. So if you collect diverse successions, sequence them across the genome to get markers, and then calculate associations between allelic state at these markers and the environment which these things were found in. So in this case, at this marker, these two different alleles don't seem to be strongly structured along this gradient, but then we scan the genome and we find some other locus where one allele is found in, let's say, dry places and the other allele is found in wet places. So this has become sort of a easy to implement approach uh, if you think your system is locally adapted and you have some idea about what might be involved in local adaptation. And we wanna sort of push this uh, a little bit farther though, because what we've started out doing in this type of approach is applying it to abiotic adaptation, but we could also have local adaptation to biotic conditions or biotic partners. And so in sorghum, which is traditionally cultivated across much of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, it's very broadly distributed. 
but within certain regions of sub-Saharan Africa, it faces parasitism from Straga hermonthica, which is a really um, major problem. It's a root parasite that reduces yields and can even kill host plants. But it, notice the distribution of the parasite is narrower than the host. So it could be that the host has some mechanisms by which it locally adapted to these regions, either mechanisms of resistance to the parasite or tolerance. So we want to explore this question. So I want to point out that instead of some abiotic gradient underlying local adaptation, you could have changes in the biotic partners in the environment. Now a little bit of biology on the system that will frame some of our investigation of diversity here. We think that stragalactones play a really important part in the host parasite relationship here. So stragalactones are hormones, plant hormones, and they're re released into soil. They're exuded from roots. Parasitic plants have seeds that are sitting out here in the soil waiting for these stragalactone signals. When they sense the stragalactones, they germinate and grow into the roots and infect the roots and take what they need, and then they reproduce. So this is a host parasite relationship that benefits the, the parasitic plant. The signaling is initiated with stragalactones. What's interesting about stragalactone signaling is it's also uh, an early stage in signaling from host plants to mycorrhizal fungi. So this could be a mutualistic relationship here that trades off against the parasitic relationship depending on what your strategy is for stragalactone exudation. So we're going to investigate stragalactone invest, uh, exudation here. And in particular, I want to start by looking at diversity at this particular gene. So this is the first gene in sorghum that was identified as probably being a mechanism of resistance to straga. This is, this is, these are results from the Ajeta lab at Purdue. And this is the product of a, a few different pieces of information starting with a biparental cross that narrowed this down to a QTL for resistance, and then some fine mapping, and then some complementary pieces of information that made them think that this is probably the gene. But basically, here's, this is showing you images of the susceptible and resistant genotypes. So here's a sorghum root in gel, and these are all these different Straga seeds, and you can see them germinating. Whereas in this resistant, or this putative resistant genotype, the Straga seeds are not germinating. And the authors show that this corresponds to a change in the major type of stragalactone exuded from 5 deoxystragol to orobancol, which seems to not stimulate germination of these parasites. Now this was identified from a biparental cross, and it was identified in a series of experiments that were done in a fairly, fairly small number of sites and also mostly in the lab. So one question, when you see a result like this, or when you obtain a result like this yourself that you might have, is how durable is this mechanism of resistance across environments and across, host, or across genetic backgrounds? Straga hermonthica is in West Africa, it's in East Africa, very broadly distributed. And there are, um, it could be that there are negative interactions between this resistance allele and different genetic backgrounds so that's not always useful, or in certain environments it may not be useful against the parasite. So what we wanted to do was investigate diversity at this locus. Now we have a problem though, which is we have all these land race, so I'm not showing you the land races here, but we had all these land race collection points. So we know land races are from individual points across the landscape. And then we also had occurrence points where we knew the parasite had been detected, mostly from museum specimens, but also from some botanical literature. What we needed to do is to have some quantitative estimate of parasite pressure or parasite prevalence in any individual location where a land race was collected. So what we did, this is work by Emily Bellis, who was a postdoc in my lab, who's now started a lab at Arkansas State just recently. She fitted a, a model that relates the suitability for Straga to underlying environmental conditions. So when you fit this model using these occurrences, what you can then do is say, for any point on the landscape, what's the suitability for Straga, or what's the likely pressure from Straga that might select for resistance or tolerance on, in sorghum? And then what we wanted to do was to look at variation at this resistance allele across the big diversity panel that we had genotyping by sequencing for. But the problem we have is that this gene here, which was putatively the resistance gene, the resistance alleles are large deletions. So here's one of them, and here's an additional large deletion. So these large deletion alleles are not really that well characterized in the GBS data, or hard to characterize in the GBS data, because you don't always know if you're just missing coverage in certain regions, or if indeed there is a large deletion there. So what Emily did was take the resequencing data and uh, characterize these deletions, and then looked at the genotype by sequencing data. And if there are accessions of sorghum or land races where we have SNP calls adjacent to the deletions, but missing from within, we call those as actual deletions. We impute those as actual deletions. And then we also found from this resequencing data an additional 
variant of unknown function, which is a frame shift early in the in, that's in this uh, first exon of this LGS1 gene. So we don't really know what the functional effect of this is, though we're following up on it. And I'll show you some results from it here in a second. So the first thing to note is that these large deletions that are putative with the resistance alleles are actually associated with the occurrence of Straga. So all the symbols on this map are sorghum land races. And the underlying surface there is the expected probability that Straga will uh, occur or the habitat suitability for Straga hermopica. So these X's are the large deletions, and you see those X's tend to occur in regions of high parasite suitability. Mostly this belt in West Africa, through this region in Sudan. And you can make a density plot here along a gradient of habitat suitability, the density of these different alleles, and you can see that the two deletion alleles shown in red and purple, or sorry, blue and purple here, are more common where the parasite is more common. So that suggests they are beneficial where the parasite is a major problem. I'm not showing you data on it, but they're also common and distributed across different genetic backgrounds. So that suggests they may be useful in, in multiple genetic backgrounds. We also, I'll also note that this frame shift has a distribution that sort of fits with the distribution of the parasite, although it's not as closely linked. So this, this red cur density curve here is the distribution of that frame shift. So we're not really sure what the functional impact or potential importance of that is, but that's something we're following up on. Now I wanna sort of get back to this question of trade-offs. Is there a trade-off associated with this mechanism of resistance? Now, I gave you that hypothesis early on that because stragalactones are used in signaling with mycorrhizal fungi, if you change stragalactones to avoid the parasite, you may impair your ability to form mycorrhizal associations. That's one way to think there might be a trade-off. Um, the authors suggest that there's, there's maybe perhaps no negative productivity side effects of this resistance mechanism, but I'm sort of just generally a skeptic. Um, the authors did do, did do assays of mycorrhizal colonization of the resistant in black and susceptible parental genotypes in gray. There's some, in some of these strains, there's some suggestion of lower mycorrhizal colonization, but it's not really um, very clear. So there's at least not a strong impairment of mycorrhizal asso association in these three lab strains of mycorrhizal fungi. But we wanted to sort of approach this in a little bit different of a way, because we see evidence for a trade-off when we look at these geographic distributions. If you look, there's this region sort of along the northern area, the drier edge of what is cultivable, that is, that is cultivated, where there are traditional sorghum varieties, land races, but the parasite does not really make it. And the resistance alleles don't really make it into those regions as well. Especially the deletion alleles don't get into these wetter regions as well. You can sort of just see this, we just plot out. This is the same plot from before, except I've just aggregated the deletions. The fact that the deletions become rarer, despite the opportunity for gene flow, where the parasite is not present, that suggests something is limiting them from increasing in frequency. On top of that, it might not be apparent, but these deletion alleles never really get to very high frequencies. So these gray circles are all the other uh, alleles that just look like the, the non-deleted or non-frame shift alleles. And there are lots of those land races there. And actually, the deletions never, even in this region, get higher than 15 to 20% frequency of land races. So the, it seems like something is constraining their rise in frequency. It could be that there's a trade-off. It could be that there's frequency-dependent selection. So that if this putative resistant allele starts to dominate the landscape, parasites adapt. And we have, we have good reason to think that that's actually a possibility here. Another thing that we've done to try to investigate this question of potential trade-offs, because we see this distributional evidence that suggests something's constraining the distribution of the resistance allele. What we've done also, and we're continuing this work, is looking at transcriptomes of these different genotypes that differ with this resistance allele. Because the idea is that the transcriptome has many traits that is characterizing, so that may give us an idea of what other traits might be affected. Because we're talking about plant hormones, right? So these things should be very pleiotropic. So what we did find is with, uh, in the root transcriptomes of the sorghum intact versus deletion or susceptible versus resistant lines, we see a few different genes that are upregulated in the resistant line in the biosynthetic pathway. You don't have to follow the details of this biosynthetic pathway, but the whole biosynthetic pathway is changing in this resistant line, despite the fact that the change in stragalactones should only be occurring at the end of this. So it could be that there's greater synthesis of, bio, of stragalactones going on. There may be higher stragalactone levels in the putative resistant line, which is a little confusing. Um, but I'll just sort of leave that at there. We're, we're following up on that. But related to this question of whether straga might be able to adapt to this resistance allele, um, we, we've seen some helpful results using some CRISPR deletion mutants that we were able to obtain recently from Corteva. So 
Um, so people at Corteva, we were on Gao especially, got interested in this system and made deletion alleles that replicate the natural resistant alleles for LGS1, this Straga resistance locus. So the one thing that we see from these deletion alleles is that indeed they are the gene that causes the low germination stimulation at this QTL. So if you look here, I'm showing you three different environmental treatments, two different Straga populations, and then the germination of Straga seeds. So the deletion allele is the putative resistant one. It is universally inducing less germination. Okay, so that suggests that there is, this is actually the gene that's causing resistance at this QTL. But one thing I want to point out is that resistance has varying levels of success depending on the abiotic treatment or the population of Straga that you're using. So this Kibos population from around Lake Victoria in Kenya has modest germination, reasonably high germination, I'd say, even against these putative resistant genotypes of, of sorghum. So I think that's a lesson that, that perhaps there is um, no free lunch associated with this resistance allele. But it is encouraging because, well, the general message is encouraging because we do have this thing being, to a certain degree, broadly distributed across Straga prone regions. This is just a picture of some of our experiments with germinating Straga seeds. Okay. Now, one other thing that we're able to do with Emily's work here is take that fitted surface of Straga prevalence and employ this environmental association analysis. So she can scan the sorghum genome now and find loci where you have a strong association between allele frequency and the prevalence of Straga harmonica as, as, as estimated from the distribution model. And we have some candidate loci that are, in, that are colored here. Here's one involved in Straga lactone signaling. I'm not gonna focus on it too much. Here's uh, a high frequency SNP in a uh, pectin esterase. Uh, which also shows a peak in Tajima's D, a population genetic statistic suggesting balancing selection at that locus. And here's the distribution of that SNP in that pectin esterase. Now, you can see it fits pretty well, the distribution of the parasite, which is why I popped out on the scan. And I'll just briefly mention that we think pectin esterase play a role because when parasites are invading the roots, there's some chain, changes in cell walls of the host that they're affecting. So there could be some corresponding mechanisms of resistance in the host. So just to conclude that section, uh, we see some evidence that this resistant allele is actually effective across backgrounds and environments, but with some constraints perhaps, and that we may be able to use this kind of approach to find new loci that cause local adaptation to this parasite in this case. Okay, so the last part of this talk, I wanna give you a brief description of a way we've tried to apply some of these associations with underlying environment to perhaps make predictions that could be useful under some setting. This is with Arabidopsis. And I wanna start with the sort of premise that if we are really um, capturing some genetic signature of local adaptation, then we should be able to make some predictions about trade-offs because those are the definition and the heart of local adaptation, right? And what we're gonna do specifically with Arabidopsis is we're gonna to try to predict changes in fitness along environmental gradients. So we're gonna take diverse accessions of Arabidopsis that have been sequenced at many markers fit a model that relates how cold it gets in the winter, so we think this is an important selective gradient um, underlying local adaptation in Arabidopsis. We fit that model and then out of sample, we're gonna develop predictions of that model for what we might call the optimal environmental, the optimal winter temperature of these different accessions of Arabidopsis. So in this case, here's these, these two alleles here might correspond to a warm environment if we see a genotype in our prediction set that has those alleles, we might predict they would be relatively more fit under warmer environments and vice versa. The data set that we're gonna use for this uh, are from a few published studies from a few years ago on Arabidopsis. So this is a, uh, one paper where they took about a thousand natural lines and uh, used a SNP array to characterize about 200,000 SNPs across the genome. And then Annie Schmidt's lab conducted four different common gardens across Europe in pretty different climates and measured fitness in the field of these Arabidopsis genotypes. So what we have total from the, in the data here that we're using are all these things that are sequenced in gray. We don't actually have those things represented in the common gardens. The blue ones are the only ones that are in the common gardens. But these gray ones, we do know the winter environment they're from, so they may be useful in the fitting of this model where we're relating genotype to underlying environment. And what we're gonna do here is a genomic selection type approach where we're going to fit um, a relationship with home minimum winter temperatures of these genotypes um, 
that it, and so these these this, this, these models have um, correlated random effects that have uh, a correlation structure that is determined by this kinship matrix. So essentially, this is this is saying um, genome-wide similarity uh, can correspond to genome in in, um, in genotype can correspond to uh, genotype similarity in home environment. So so we're going to fit that, and here's the underlying gradient of minimum winter temperature, just to get a sense for that. So then we we fit that model and then we do cross validation and make out of sample predictions of what I've been calling a latent cold adapted phenotype. So the idea is that we're fitting a model that relates this home winter environment to genotype. And we don't really know what the phenotype necessarily is that underlies adaptation to that specific environment. And it's really something multidimensional, right? For that reason, I'm just calling it a latent cold adapted phenotype. So we don't really know what it is. Another way to think of it is really what I'm showing you here are the predicted minimum temperatures, so the G bluffs for the predicted home minimum temperatures of these ecotypes. <laughs> so if we look at the variation in these predictions among genotypes and then look at the relative fitness in, in Finland, we see that, and we, fit, we can fit a quadratic and see there's some optimal value for relative fitness that is fairly low in terms of the winter minimum temperature environment that we predict that it has the highest relative fitness. And then we can look at how that corresponds, like how that changes across these four different common gardens. And you can see for the UK, so here's, I'll just show you the results specifically from the UK here. This is from Norwich, where it doesn't really get that cold in the winter. The latent cold adapted phenotype or the predicted winter cold environment of these different ecotypes that had the highest relative fitness was the maximum one. So there seemed to be no value for having these colder um, winter home genetic signatures in the UK. And the same was true for the Spanish site. So here I'm now showing you the actual temperature of the common garden. So how, what's the climate at that location? Here's Finland, Germany, UK, Spain. And then which of these predicted phenotypes or these winter cold predictions for these different genotypes had the highest maximum fitness from these curves? So you can see in Finland, pretty cold genotype had the highest fitness. In Germany, is intermediate. And then in the UK and Spain, it increases. So just fitting this model of genotype to home environment, we're able to do some prediction out of sample for changes in relative fitness across the gradient. So perhaps there's some value to that in conservation or perhaps if we're interested in breeding things for specific environments. So just to summarize the three parts today, um, I think there's some evidence that local adaptation is important in crop land races and, and an important factor select shaping genetic variation across the genome. Uh, I think that there's some evidence we maybe can use genome environment associations to find new loci that cause local adaptation in land races or, or other systems. And that these, these environmental associations may also have some value for predicting genotype environment interactions. So with that, I want to thank a few co-authors from the Rice Project that I didn't mention, some of our other co-authors from the Straga Project, and funding sources for some of the work. Thank you. Yes. Is there a role of polyploidy in any of this? <laughs> conversation, I understand, but can you say anything about that? Um, okay, so um, I guess there's a lot of connections. None of these are polyploid. Um, there's a lot of connections I guess you could draw. Um, people have maybe supposed that some polyploids are, are more plastic and perhaps in that case maybe less closely locally adapted to their environments and maybe more of a more of an environmental generalist. Um, I don't know, there's a there's, there's a hypothesis uh, for local adaptation there. Um, yeah, I, I haven't worked in any polyploid systems, I have to admit, and I haven't, well, we're, we actually are working in switchgrass now, and, but we sort of, we're fairly early in the project, and I need to think harder about it um, to have some more insightful thing to say. Sorry. Um, so, in calculating the um, travel distance, um, have you considered things like currents and winds, or did you just use the geographical distance? Yeah, so, so we haven't considered some of the heterogeneity that you might have over the ocean, like currents or winds. That's what Emma, who's the archeologist, sort of specializes in, and so she's working now on trying to do some of that um, for like a next generation of this. Uh, but this is sort of our first stab at it. Cool. John Luke. Um, so you, you had this uh, latent cold adapted phenotype, and you said we don't really know what it is. So you said this is just I forget what variable you use, but you pick yeah. one variable to substitute in for that latent variable. Do you have approaches to to to, to try to uh, 
piece together what the latent variable might look like from a multivariate observed phenotype traits perspective? Yeah, yeah. So, so just to be clear here, um, what I'm what I'm doing is. I'm picking an environmental gradient that I think is important in local adaptation, which is how cold does it get in the winter? And there is evidence that that, that is an important selective gradient in Arabidopsis, independent of this. Now, um, then what I'm saying is, if, if they are adapted along this gradient, there's some multidimensional phenotype behind that. Um, and I don't know what it is, but here I'm just fitting a model for home and winter temperature, and then I'm making predictions out of sample for home winter temperature. But there, you know, I'm not, so, you know, the prediction is like, what would be your environmental home if, if you know, you had, if, if you were from the, you know, if you were a natural genotype. These are all natural genotypes, but you could do this for breeding lines, or admi you know, things that are um, admixtures and make predictions about like, what would be your home environment based on your genomic signature. That's the flavor, that's what we're doing. Another way I sort of try to think of it is there's this latent multidimensional phenotype. Now, you could um, go to high dimensional phenotype data and ask what corresponds to this variation. So transcriptome data or, you know, with model system, we've got lots of experiments, lots of phenotypes from different situations where you could, you know, sort of mine the data for the phenotypes that are associated with this genetic variation. Uh, that may be something that you could do, yeah. Yeah. Um, when working with this or the uh, sort of environmental GWAS association, uh, how do you make sure, or like, what would be the best way of making sure that you're not explaining the population structure that might be highly correlated with a given phenotype of interest. Yeah, so I think that sort of depends on the goal. Um, in the case where we're like scanning the genome and trying to identify individual loci that are, you know, single locus effects on local adaptation, what we do is we essentially control for the genetic background just as you do in association models with the random effects that are correlated according to the genome-wide similarity of your genotypes. In this case, I'm not as so much worried about identifying an individual locus, so I'm actually just using that whole genome-wide signature of variation among genotypes to, to make, to predict differences in this trait, or trait in quotes, yeah. Yeah, so um, one of your systems is, is one involving natural distributions of plants, and two of them involve land races and cultivated right. plants. Um, and of course, in the, in the in the Arabidopsis discussion, you didn't talk about language groups or human migration patterns at all. I'm just wondering if there are any emergent properties of these two kinds of systems uh, that uh, are beginning to be recognizable as being uh, uh, different aspects of, of how the genotypes are becoming uh, adapted. So some generalities about differences between these cultivated and natural systems. Um, one, thing that, one thing that's pretty, that's maybe not that interesting, but one thing that, that has shown up um, is that the uh, structuring along these environmental gradients is much stronger in the crop land races. So, so more of the genome, of course, is, is correlated with uh, the environmental gradients in the land races than it is in Arabidopsis. So that could be because, um, you know, these crops have much more recently spread across these gradients. So there's been a lot more of the genome that's been carried along with locally adaptive variation, um, such that you have lots more structure along environmental gradients in the land races. You know, they're talking about a few thousand years versus tens of thousands or more. I mean, the glaciation, you know, at least so there's a whole long set of demographic. Anyway, so I'm not going to get into all that for Arabidopsis, but um, that's sort of one contrast. I mean, the, the, the case for these land races may be sort of more similar to uh, what we see in invasive uh, populations, much more recently established populations that nevertheless become locally adapted. Including Arabidopsis has locally adapted, it seems, populations in North America that are non-native. Um, we're about to start a pretty extensive project on cheatgrass out west. Um, which has only been out west for 100 years or so, but has pretty clearly locally adapted across the landscape. And that may be a more similar pattern, at least in terms of large portions of the genome being um, varying along these gradients. And it becomes a little tricky to sort of retrospectively figure out what's driving local adaptation when such large portions of the genome are, are co-varying, uh, perhaps for spurious reasons of, of limited gene flow. Um, 
So it may be harder to do in these land race systems than in natural systems where there's been more gene flow across gradients. Um, I feel like maybe I'm starting to ramble. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, feel, I wish I had something uh, more pithy. Kind of artificial versus natural selection Well, so, so one thing that's kind of, one, one thing I'll say that I've become interested in is, um, you know, it's been easy for us to do these analysis using climate gradients because you just go and download some climate data set. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's like the best way to characterize a selective, uh, the selection at an individual location. Um, and of course, in the agricultural context, you could have differences in agronomy, differences in management, uh, or different purposes things are being selected for, forage versus grain, et cetera. Um, that's sort of one complexity that may interact with these large scale abiotic gradients that are easily download data for that's much harder to characterize this local small scale stuff. Similarly for Rabidopsis, they occur across a pretty wide range of microhabitats, um, early successional sandy beaches, rocky, hab rocky outcrops, um, agricultural fields. Uh, and so what these environmental conditions mean in those different contexts is not the same thing, just like in the agricultural thing, ag agricultural systems where different agronomies or usage purposes may mean that a given abiotic stressor doesn't mean the same thing for these different um, local contexts. So that, that's a sort of, Frontier to sort of what we're trying to do go for, going forward with some of this stuff. Yeah. 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 The local uh, environment uh, parameters or usage part. Do you consider the local scene of that? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I didn't really talk about much here that has sort of been something I think about a lot. Uh, I'm not sure. Reviewers have never really pointed to it and said, oh, that's great. So I don't really know how much anyone cares about it. But um, in all these systems, we've been trying to model growing seasons to get a better picture of what are likely selective gradients. Because you know anything that has some phenology where it's dormant for part of the year, either as a seed or as a, let's say, a perennial that drops its leaves, that's deciduous, it, it, you know, the conditions at a given time of year are much more important if you have sensitive vegetative or reproductive tissue that's out there, right? So that's why we've been trying to build growing season models or just work with existing growing season models to characterize conditions during growing seasons as perhaps a more accurate measure of the selective pressures at a given location. And it is important, especially for things like moisture and Arabidopsis, you know, these Arabidopsis ecotypes from the Mediterranean often have pretty fast life cycles in these winter, actually often fairly wet growing seasons. It does rain in the wintertime. And they'll start, you know, in January or February, and it's actually not that dry. They're not out there growing in the middle of the summer when the rains stop. So those things are important. Um, this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.